This is Real Estate Rookie episode 276. There's literally no reason not to use a broker. They'll negotiate for you. They have a better sense of what's going on in the market, what um, what valuation is, you know, the right valuation, what to come in at, how to negotiate. I would so that's number one, find a broker. And they're out there. And I would search for specifically a commercial broker. Um, some kind of dip in both worlds, but if you're doing commercial all day long, you just have a better sense of what's going on in the market. My name is Ashley Kerr, and I'm here with my co-host, Tony Robinson. And welcome to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, where every week, twice a week, we bring you the inspiration, motivation, and stories you need to hear to kickstart your investing journey. Today, I want to shout out someone by the username of Kel Bell Atwell. Um, he loves us a five-star review and says, my husband and I both started listening to this podcast in October of 2022 and have been so inspired by Tony, Ashley, and all of their guests. With the help of this show, we were able to jump into action and purchase our first home by mid-December. As RAF guides, we spend half the year in Colorado and the other other half in St. Louis, so the game plan now is to utilize our other St. Louis home as a midterm rental for traveling nurses during rafting season and the fall months where we're out in Colorado. Thank you so much all for the great insight. Kel Bell Atwell, we love hearing stories just like that, so we appreciate you giving us a shout out in that five-star review. And if you're a rookie audience member and you haven't yet left us a review, please do. The more views we get, more views we, we can... Or sorry, the more reviews we get, the more people we can help. More people we can help is what we love doing here. So there you go. Ashley, what's going on? How You got like a different background today. You're just like traveling the last couple of weeks. Every time I see you, it's a, a different scenery behind you. Yeah, well, this one is because we usually don't record on this day. So I'm actually at what is going to be my future office. So I'm currently sitting at, so I did Boom. like a full kitchen in here. So it could be a residential unit too. If, you know, I didn't need it as my office anymore. But I'm currently sitting at the kitchen counter where the dishwasher goes. And I ha- I don't have the dishwasher yet. So my legs are just under <laughs> in that opening of the cabinet. But it's actually a dirty convenient sitting there. So it's not a school. But. Yeah. And, and you got like a beautiful view behind you. These picturesque windows. Yeah. And then there's a, a driveway out there and a concrete pad. But then on the other side of the driveway is a beautiful pond um, out there. So it's actually... So the kids can play out there and stuff while I sit in here and work. Yeah. Well, we got a we got a good episode for the people today, right? We've got uh, Annie Larner on, and Annie is a commercial real estate broker. She's been in the game for a while, and like, guys, she is just like such a wealth of knowledge, and she gives like a, I don't know, like think of James Daynard's episode when it came to uh, like estimating rehab costs. This is the equivalent for working with a commercial broker. Like she has so much information on on how to be effective in that relationship and what to look for and what works and what doesn't work. So um, I, I really enjoyed this conversation with her today. Yeah. And I think uh, a key takeaway is, you know, Tony mentioned that, you know, working with a commercial broker and if your first thought was, I'm going for off market deals, I'm not going to use a, an agent that she goes ex- into exactly why you should use a broker when you are buying commercial. And I think that they're great examples and it can be such a benefit to you. I didn't even realize that there was websites. She talks about different websites like LoopNet and Craigslist, which C-R-E-I-X-I it is. You should be signed up for if you're looking for commercial real estate. But she talked about a couple other ones that you only have access to um, if you are a commercial broker. And it's not like the MLS where you can go and see what's on the MLS on Zillow or Realtor.com. So I found that really interesting. And it's just one of the benefits. But lots of great information Annie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Can you start off telling everyone a little bit about yourself? Yeah, you got it. Thanks so much for having me. Um, My name's Annie Larner, and I'm a commercial real estate broker in Colorado, northern Colorado, specifically the greater Boulder area, as we say. And um, in Colorado, real estate brokers um, can practice whatever they want, residential or commercial. But generally what happens is you sort of fall into one or the other and um, end up specializing in one or the other because they're somewhat different worlds and we'll, I'm sure, get into what that all means. But um, I specialize in commercial, so we do sales and leasing of commercial properties. And I'm on a team with about six other brokers and yeah, I got into commercial real estate uh, by way of marketing, actually. My background is kind of marketing and consulting for businesses. I've always been in B2B. I love working with businesses. I specifically love working with small businesses. So commercial, when I started working 
for real estate and my clients became real estate brokers, uh, my interest with real estate combined with my love of working with businesses and um, and now investors often and uh, kind of combined both worlds. So that's how I landed in brokerage. And what about investing yourself? Can you tell us a little bit about your personal experience as an investor? Yeah, totally. Um, when you when you jump into real estate, uh, you end up just seeing a lot of deals and um, kind of by accident. I didn't really have a ton of intention to invest a lot in real estate, but we f- stumbled on some properties and um, was able to combine money with other uh, brokers and work out some deals. I have a, a friend who kind of has a lot more uh, assets than we do. And so he worked out deals with us and brings deals where he will put down the majority of the money and then we come in um, as a minority share owner of a property and we put together an LLC and buy it. And so we found um, uh, some a residential property uh, in this area that was kind of like a flip and we ended up buying it and we put maybe $40,000 into it and then we rented it for a year and just kind of stocked away some money. We didn't treat it as an income property really. It was more just like savings, whatever. We maximized the rent as much as possible and then um, we were able to put that back on the market a year later and I think we bought it for like three eighty two, and rented it out, covered all our expenses for the year. We put 40000 in and then the next year sold it for six now I'm trying to remember 650 something uh one year later so it was a good little project so those are kind of the the deals that we're looking that was like it, it was lucky but like they don't all like work at, we just got kind of lucky with that one it worked out really well and it just was in this perfect spot and you know three bedroom two bathroom a yard which is around here three bedroom two bathroom and a yard is everything you need because you need space for dogs because if you don't have a space for dogs you eliminate so much of your renter pool and um, with three bedroom two bathroom you can get a group of young adults that can all put up a little bit more of a budget if you make it like somewhat nice and not super college you know whole type of thing then you can bring in um, a few more people so we that's what we kind of focused on and I love that you have experience on, on kind of both sides of, of the spectrum and, and you talked about this a little bit already but they're they're obviously benefits to both the commercial and the residential space but for our rookie audience a lot of them maybe don't have any deals yet um do you think that there are enough benefits for them to jump into commercial as their first deal or do you feel that you know a lot of the people that you work with are they usually more experienced investors that have kind of worked their way up to commercial or i I guess what are are your thoughts there yeah good question Uh Definitely real commercial investors tend to be a little bit more savvy because they've maybe been doing it a little longer. And mainly the big difference is they have a little bit more capital. Um, I think that's I think that's probably the biggest barrier to entrance. If you do want to start investing in commercial, I think it's just as easy, if not easier. And there's a lot of benefits for buying commercial property over residential that appeal to me even. Um but the problem is you just need a little bit more capital because commercial buildings tend to, not always, but they tend to be a little bit more expensive and you need a lot more capital to sustain them in terms of maintenance and vacancies that you have to deal with. But the deals are longer. So um, if you can if you can absorb a lot of that, you can you can set yourself up for commercial. But there's certainly workarounds and um I think if you can pool money with groups and work with a good broker broker who can help you work through all of those deal structures um it's a really good opportunity yeah and i'd love to share more about like how to look at commercial deals and um what to watch out for how it's a little bit different just one one follow-up question to that annie because you said that it's just as easy if not easier to get a commercial deal can like elaborate on that because i think for most of our rookies that are listening they, they think of the word commercial and they just you know they're they're overwhelmed by everything that goes into that so elaborate on what you feel it might be actually easier to get a commercial deal um well there's there, the pool of buyers is smaller just simply put i mean you have with residential you have at least around here we have a strong market here and you have a lot of buyers lined up even in this weird downturn that we're experiencing right now and with commercial they sit on the market a long time i mean nine months it's not unusual for a commercial property that's for sale especially one that's in the more accessible kind of range we're talking about something maybe five hundred thousand to 1.5 million um a, a building like that sometimes, especially if it doesn't have the income that a lot of the investors want to see, will sit there for a while and there's actually room for negotiation. Um, you can actually put in an offer that's, you know, what you can afford and then and then go to the table to negotiate where sometimes with um, investors, you have to have 
when you're investing in residential properties or looking to do flips, I think that there's a longer line out that door and you have to get a little bit more aggressive. So I guess acquisition is what I mean by that with commercial. It's a little bit, you have a little, a few more options. Um, you just kind of got to know what you're looking for and be ready. Annie, for a rookie investor that's going to be listening to this podcast and thinking, you know what, I think I would actually like to try investing in commercial real estate. Where is the first place or the first thing they should do to actually, you know, start that action to propel themselves into the commercial side of investing? Yeah, great question. Caveat, I'm a broker, but I would say find a broker. Um, Number one, in the commercial side, properties, we are not as readily available um, to search and find in commercial the way that they are in residential. And the biggest reason is that we don't really have the equivalent of an MLS in the commercial world, um, this multiple listing system. And what, what those what those do, they're so nice. I mean, you can love them, you can hate them. But one thing they do, ni- do nicely is syndicate all these properties to these different websites that are totally available to the public. On commercial, we have LoopNet. And I'm sure if you've ever looked up commercial properties, you've used LoopNet. LoopNet's great. It's public. It's the public-facing um, version of CoStar, and CoStar is by far the market leader in um, the property data exchanges. But um, other than LoopNet, everything else is behind a wall <laughs> that's accessible by licensed brokers. So all of these um, property exchange databases that we call like Catalyst, CoStar, CoStar LoopNet. Crexy, um, Crexy, you can use with an, an, a login, and I would recommend that for um, investors who are looking to just kind of browse properties. But um, ultimately, you're going to have brokers who have access to the pool of properties that are available, and they're going to be more um, networked with other brokers in the industry and know what properties are coming up, what what's available. They're going to be more likely to be able to access off-market deals for you. So just finding a property alone, just use a broker. If you're a buyer, it's just the same as it is in residential where you don't pay for your broker and you don't pay their commissions. The landlord or seller pays the commissions. The only time when you might pay commissions to a buyer's broker is if you bought an off-market deal, which is something you got to be ready for. And they might want to sign a exclusive with you so that you do cover their fees if it's off-market. And that does tend to happen depending on what you're looking for. But for the most part, you'll find something on the market. And so there's no, there's literally no reason not to use a broker. They'll negotiate for you. They have a better sense of what's going on in the market, what, um, what valuation is, you know, the right valuation, what to come in at, how to negotiate. I would so that's number one, find a broker. And they're out there. And I would search for specifically a commercial broker. Um, some kind of dip in both worlds, but if you're doing commercial all day long, you just have a better sense of what's going on in the market. To kind of follow up with the, that question, and you already answered part of it for me as to you know what value can you expect a broker to bring to you? So you said negotiating, you know, help you figure out where the market is at, you know, what this property is actually valued at, things like that. What are some other things that a broker would help you with. Um, So maybe during the acquisition side, are they helping you with, here's the items like a lease agreement, things like that, that you should be getting from the seller. And then after you're under contract, are they assisting in the due diligence? And so what are those kind of pieces that someone should ask if a broker is kind of knowledgeable in those areas and provides those services? Definitely. Um, A broker will definitely yeah number one help you find out what's on the market get if you if you get under contract get under contract at the right price um and then due diligence is pretty long we tend to be under contract for 30 to 90 days in commercial i have a deal closing next week that's almost 90 days that we've been under contract and it wasn't even complicated um it just takes a long time to get environmentals done uh inspections there's a lot of title work and then of course tenants so that's the next thing that i'll speak to ashley tenants can be if you're buying a building with tenants, tenant or tenants in it, there's a level of complexity there where, um, imagine this, you had uh, an owner that's had a commercial building with a bunch of tenants in it for, I don't know, 10 years. And over those 10 years, they've signed five different leases or six different leases and releases and some are gross leases and some are net leases and some are modified gross. Some you know, have a deal with the guy that if he cleans the closet and gets foot massages on Fridays, that he gets $200 off of his rent that month. And all of this stuff survives closing. So that has to be captured and um, and recorded and represented through what are called estoppels. And 
I'm sure if you've bought houses with renters, you've had estoppels, but with commercial, they can get really complicated because it's these, it's people's businesses and it affects their bottom line. And it's, it's, it's important that, you know, whatever security deposits and all kinds of stuff that all has to be transferred in your settlement sheets later at closing. So these estoppels can get a little complicated and you want to make sure you have a broker that's helping you take a look at those and make sure everything checks out that that transfer, um, into landlord that landlord role when you when these tenants survive closing is smooth and that there's a really strong understanding i have a building right now that we closed on in december and it had 12 estoppels <laughs> 12 tenants and it was like an 8,000 square foot building it wasn't big so lots of tenants for it and um at, we're now however many months later and there's questions coming up again about estoppels and security deposits and last month's rents and things that weren't accounted for and um in theory, nothing has to happen because that those estoppels are legal documents that survive closing. But um, we we now have questions about that, so we got to be super diligent about how that's handled. Um, and a broker will come by your side. And then, sorry, I'm talking a lot, but uh, just to answer your second question about um, what happens when you do become a landlord and how a broker can help you, again, leasing. So leasing is an ongoing thing. If you have tenants and you're going to have to keep tenants and that's part of your investment strategy, you're not actually occupying it. You're trying to just gain, you're just doing it for income. Um, you're going to want a broker that knows a lot about the market and what rents are in the market and how to negotiate a strong um, tenant for you, how to vet the tenant that comes to the table, um, how to get longer deals for you. Um, and leasing is just an ongoing thing. Renewals, leases start to expire. You want people are going to renegotiate that. And it's really nice to have a broker on your side who can just handle that for you. You can do the leasing yourself. Um, and I would recommend doing a lot of good research about how to negotiate good leases. But I can't tell you how many times I've worked with sellers who come to the table and just you could tell they weren't working with a broker because their leases all are all super under market. Rents are really under market. You have messy lease documents that are hard to make heads or, heads or tails of. And that affects you when you go to sell the building and you get under contract and you have to do due diligence and everybody starts looking at these messy leases and says, oh my gosh, what? These are way under market. The value of this building's not here. These cap rates don't check out. Um, and, and then you have to renegotiate your price. So having really strong leases in place with um, rents that make sense that are either at or above market will help you when you go to, to earn your money back at sale. Yeah, Andy, so much valuable information there. And I, I just want to call out because I... I know for so many of our rookies, they can probably be listening to this and like their like heads are spinning. But I think that goes back to the point of why having someone that has the experience is so important if you do want to get into the commercial space. But I'm um, just one last thing on like the the due diligence period. We I think we all are somewhat familiar with what happens with a single family house during uh, escrow and, and kind of the inspections you need to pull, but. During with a commercial property, what are some of the additional inspections that someone should be looking at to make sure that this property is a, a smart one to buy? Yeah, almost always you're going to see an environmental done. So um, we call that there's a phase one, phase two. Fa there, there's different phases of environmentals that you do. At a minimum, you're probably going to want to do a phase one. And so that's going to go through the building and test for asbestos and other toxic materials that might be throughout the building. And those can get really complicated if you have a building that has changed ceiling tiles. And because each ten, if you have a multi-tenant building and in each 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 of these different units, the tenants have done different build outs for their business. You're going to have a variety of different materials throughout the buildings. Um, this same property that I mentioned that was this 8,000, roughly 7,000 square foot building, we did environmental and I think they took 90 samples for the environmental. So it took all day and it was really long. And that's just a phase one. And then if you're sitting on a property that's an industrial property that has like more complexities, um, you might get into a phase two, depending on the, what comes back from that phase one. And um, you could you could end up buying a building that's a brown site. I mean, there's a lot of different with when it comes to commerce, you have businesses doing a lot of different things on these properties. And so environmentals are really important. And that's usually what causes the you to be under contract for so much longer on commercial. I had a property under contract that went into a phase one. It was self storage, but it also had a commercial building with it. And the phase one failed because there was a mechanic shop operating out of it. And the phase one notated that there could have been oil spillage. Uh, so we uh, wanted to go to a phase two, but the seller wouldn't allow it. He wouldn't allow the phase two to be done on the property 
And, you know, our broker told us that that could be because if there is an issue and we back out, he is now aware of that issue and has to disclose it and most likely would have to remediate it. Uh, so we actually, you know, walked away from that deal because we couldn't, the seller wouldn't even agree. And he ended up uh, reimbursing me for the phase one. And I gave him that report. So he did have it for another buyer. Um, so that kind of worked out okay. And I didn't lose a lot of money in doing my due diligence. But that's something else to be aware of too, is that you're ready to move forward. And the seller actually puts a stop to it and says, I don't want to know <laughs> what's wrong with it. <laughs> totally. I, I can't. These commercial deals unravel in the final hour so often because because most of the buyers are investors um, and the sellers are investors. You have a lot. First of all, maybe a lot of ego, <laughs> but also um, oftentimes uh, if, the, if the deals, the dumbers don't make sense, they're just going to walk away and walk to the next one. So it's it's really tenuous. The process can fall apart um, at inspection resolution or in that final hour so often. And I would say that's another thing to really be ready for, just just like with your story, Ashley. So Annie, one thing that you mentioned that I, I just want to make sure we go back to was uh, cap rate. You you very briefly mentioned that word. So can you, can you break down or, or define exactly what a cap rate is and what role it plays in commercial real estate? Yeah, absolutely. So in, in commercial real estate, we value properties uh, by a few different methods, depending on the situation. And this is like real estate 101. So everybody, but bear with me. But you know, um, you can look at just a comp, purely comps. Um, or you can look at underlying land value if the property is a piece of crap and ultimately someone wants to just redevelop it or do some urban infill. So you, there's really no value in the structure and you're looking at under, underlying land value. So you do a per per square foot or per acre basis. And then there's income. And, um, and that's the most common one is because most people invest in commercial for the income. Um, you look at income and the way we uh, value an income property is through this capitalization rate. And it's just this dumb formula that can be really confusing, but basically you take your net operating income, so your NOI, which is, which is your income minus everything it takes to operate and run the building. So taxes, insurance, maintenance, and you even take your loan out of there. So cap rates don't account for your loan. It's really just trying to look at the building itself. And we get that NOI and you divide it by the value of the building or what you want the value of the building to be. So if it's a million dollars, if it's on the market for a million dollars, you would take the NOI and divide it by um, a million. And you end up with this percentage that's somewhere between 4% and like 10%. And really what it is it, it's not really a return as much as it is a measure of risk, risk and return. Um, so a, a cap rate that is in that four to five percent is going to tell you that this is a property that has a high value. It's probably in like a more urban market, like in our case, Boulder, um, where where value is sustained and continuously increases. But the rents as a result against that value are not as high. And so um, you're getting a lower cap rate on that, but it's a more safe long-term investment it's going to grow steadily it's like the bonds of commercial real estate and then um a higher cap rate is simply going to tell you it's a riskier market like the value is lower as compared with the income but the odds of you finding really good long-term tenants might be a little lower because you're out in more of a rural or a suburban market um that that is a little less of a surefire bet so it's just riskier right so it's sort of the the stock of um, real estate investments. So cap rates are, you're gonna hear it all the time. And a lot of times you'll buy a building that like there is no cap rate listed and you're like, what's the cap rate? Well, it might be empty. Or in the case of a building I'm under contract right now, there's like half of it's rented and the other half isn't. And so um, in that case, cap, rate, cap rate's irrelevant. You could do a pro forma cap rate and estimate, well, based on market rents and the number of square footage, the rentable versus usable, we would estimate that you could get this cap rate if you bought it for this, but ultimately there is no cap rate. So you're not, you have to think about how it's valued. So in, in that case, we'd rely on comps and look at price per square foot of similar buildings that have sold in that market and estimate like, this is what it could be, but it's not quite there. So we'll give you a discount for that. And this is what the, this is how we've arrived at this price per square foot. If I'm a new investor, Annie, how do I figure out what the cap rate is for any given area? Mm. Well, I would just go to LoopNet. Go to LoopNet and do a find. A, first of all, pick your what do you want to invest in? Retail, industrial, or um, 
office industrial tends to have more of those lower cap rates because you have really long term tenants and the value is always high of industrial buildings like warehouses and stuff. But pick one of those and then do a search for all 10 to 20,000 square foot warehouses in your in a certain market and just filter it by that and start looking at brochures and listings and see what they're listing the cap rate at. Um, and usually they'll call it out. They'll be like, this is an eight cap, like check it out, eight cap. And you're like, yeah, but it's in, you know, it's in Salem. I don't, you know, somewhere it's just like, duh, of course it's an eight cap. But if you, if you go into like a more of an urban area, like a college town or somewhere like that, and um, you'll see this often on multifamily in like a college town, right? Where rents are always really steady. And, and you're going to mostly see for multifamily always has the lowest caps because, again, it's so steady and they just everybody needs a place to live. And so if you're buying a multifamily property, even like four units, you're going to expect that four to five cap. If you see a six cap on a multifamily in like a college town, for example, that's probably a good buy. But you're going to have a lot of people lined up for a, a buy like that. Danny, when looking at a cap rate that's on a listing, and is there anything you should be doing to verify that the cap rate is actually calculated correctly. Are there some common things that you see that maybe the seller didn't tell the broker about or whatever that is, but are there just like a couple things that we should be looking for when analyzing a deal that might have been left out when the cap rate was kind of configured? Absolutely. Great question. Because yeah, the cap rate is a good thing to verify. One, because they might have not calculated it correctly and there's actually a higher cap rate um, and you discover that and that's a total nugget or that they are totally bloating the cap rate. So um, the first thing you'll do, you don't even have to be under contract actually, when something's for sale and you're interested in it, ask for rent roll. And so that's going to be like a spreadsheet that you're going to get from the brokers listing it or the seller. And um, this is going to show all the different tenants, what rent they're paying, when their lease ends, um, some other like high level strokes there on their terms on the, of their leases. And then on that rent roll, it should show all expenses as well. And from there, you'll see, okay, taxes, here's what insurance is, here's what maintenance is. And um, sometimes, often you can tell like pretty quickly how savvy a seller is and how good of track they've been keeping of these expenses um, based on whether those are estimated. And if you think they're estimated, you can just start asking some questions like, what are really the expenses here? Did did this guy get out and shovel the snow by himself every day? Um, who, who, who fixed the roof? Like, did you pay a roofer or did you get up there and like play with some tar? Like really find out what the expenses are going to be when you take this on, how much you're willing to do yourself. Um, check the taxes and make sure that those are listed correctly. And um, you can quickly look at all that stuff to make sure that the cap rate uh, was calculated correctly. And then you can start playing with your offer, right? So if you if it's listed for $1 million and you know you're not going to buy it for anything more than 850000 then you calculate the NOI against your um, anticipated purchase acquisition price and figure out what your cap rate is that you're going for. And I think that's one of the things that makes commercial real estate so... Um, enticing for so many people is that you have more control over the, the the value of that property because if I buy a single family house, you know most of our portfolio we, we buy short term rentals and we can take that property and make it perform tremendously well, but the value of that property is always going to be tied to comparable sales of other houses in that area. But if I go out and I buy a hotel, I can and I can take the NOI from you know five hundred thousand dollars to a million dollars. Now I've I've significantly increased the value of that property. So I'm just curious, Andy, like for from the clients that you've worked with, have you seen them utilize that strategy effectively where they they buy an underperforming asset, they're able to stabilize it, improve it, and dramatically increase the value of that property? A hundred percent. So that's that's the goal, right? That's our ultimately our goal is to buy an underperforming piece of property and stabilize rents. And um, if you can find an opportunity for that and, and then get it for the right price, of course every seller thinks that their property doesn't stink at all and they they're so you gotta get it for the right price, but once you do that and then over time, I mean, this stuff takes time, right? Because commercial leases are usually two to five, sometimes seven, 10 years long. And um, it might take time to get it to a stable enough place to take it back to market. But again, another reason to work with a broker who can work on um, stabilizing that property and getting some, some nice rents in there for you. But yes, that's exactly the goal. Stabilize it, add some value, make sure you're taking good care of the building too. You don't want it to have any major problems that can be uncovered in due diligence and then bring it back to market. That's exactly right, Tony. 
I love that. Yeah. And that's, um, we just, we got a campground under contract in West Virginia right now. And that's a big goal of ours is that, you know, they've dramatically underutilized this property and there's some, some big upside there. So I'm, I'm excited for that. Um, you, you, you mentioned another word that I want to go back to any, which was pro forma. Um, can you define what that is? And if you can also pro formers aren't always like the best source of, of information to really understand how a property might do. You know, you see some sellers that have pro formas that say this is the world's best property, but you do a little bit of digging and you find something else. So what exactly is a pro forma and how can a rookie real estate investor use that to make a smart decision about buying a property? Totally. Don't be intimidated by a pro forma. They're, they're actually kind of, you could use a really simple one. You can get really complicated and get really out of control on it. But a pro forma is basically a spreadsheet that you're going to use to calculate how you think this property can perform, what kind of income you can really get from it um, if you did everything that you want to do in the end, if, if all things are perfect. So if you buy a building that's 80% leased and um, you know that you want to get it up to like 95% lease, you want to get these longer term deals in, you want to get the best rents you can, what is what is your rate of return when you do that? And it, What'd you buy it for? And then in your pro forma, that's where you do want to start playing with loan money. So um, you throw in what you, how much you're financing, how much cash, when you want to refinance. You can, you can get really complicated with these, but ultimately a pro forma is just saying, this is what the picture is today. And, and in the future, this is what it's going to look like if I can do everything that I want to do and um, create the value that I want to create. Annie, when doing the pro forma, what are some things that someone should kind of be aware of? So, for example, if the seller prepared a pro forma is to like, here's what the property is doing now, but we know that it can do this. What are some things that you're even if you're creating the pro forma on your own um, that people should watch out for that might not even be on the actual? So, like one thing. I've seen that's common around Buffalo is, you know, you're buying from a mom and pop, you know, the, the pop goes and he does the snow plowing. So there's no nothing that's listed on the expenses for snow plowing or, you know, maybe their insurance policy doesn't even cover anything. Like we toured a camp campground before that had wood burning stoves in some of the cabins. Their insurance policy did not cover if something happened with those wood burning stoves. So like, that just showed that the premium was probably going to be a lot higher than what they had that was on their current profit and loss. So can you touch on maybe those some of those other things that we should keep an eye out for? Yeah, I think honestly, you kind of just nailed it. Um, expenses. I think expenses is the biggest thing. You Everybody can like bloat their rent. One, be conservative on rents. You know, you don't know what's going to happen in this world. Uh, we're having a crisis in office right now. So a lot of people had pro formas that are not working for them in office at all right now. So be super conservative on your rents and be... Um, it, be what's the opposite of liberal on your expenses. Um, <laughs> just just know that however that seller is running the, the property right now, you're probably going to spend way more than they did, even if you don't. But just but in your pro forma, pretend like you are. You're going to hire out that snow removal company. You're going to work with the roofer. You're going to get over insured. You're going to get the umbrella, everything. And then you're going to have to deal with financing, too, because nobody has two million dollars laying around like you will have. Um, and it might and it might be that you don't make money on this property for five years. It might be you don't make money for seven years, especially when when you're in a market with those lower cap rates, like it takes time to make money. Um, and so just, so yeah, I would say just be liberal on the expenses and conservative on your rents and, um, and just try to work with the worst case scenarios. And if it's still working, it might be worth taking a look at. Yeah. So you, you mentioned Annie about, uh, office kind of being in a crisis right now. Uh, I, I guess I'm just curious with all the experience that you have, how are you seeing investors in the commercial space kind of pivot given where we're at in the economic cycle today? Yeah, it's a big one. Um, here in our market in Boulder, uh, our office vacancies are at 12.6% right now. And that's still not that high. It's just really high for us. Um, I think New York City's at 15% potentially. Um, and in Boulder, just by comparison, our historic rents over the last five to six years have been around six to 8% or vacancies, excuse me. So, uh, so, so 12% is double and we're definitely feeling it. It feels like there's just office everywhere. Um, so, you know, I don't, I, I think that, I think sellers are, and landlords, so on the rent side, are getting there. They kind of understand the state that we're in, that they're going to start 
needing to make more concessions, that prices and rents are going to need to reflect the market. But we've had such good rents historically that it's going to be slower than we want it to be for, for sellers to respond. Landlords. Meanwhile, buyers and tenants expect the world. So in, in office, we're just we're getting offers. Um, we're getting proposals for rents that are half of asking. And we're seeing offers, you know, where you can tell the buyers are just expecting this fire sale and and sellers just aren't there yet. So we're, we're kind of in this gap period. And I think sellers are waiting for things to bounce back or level out a bit. Buyers are sitting on cash and thinking that they're going to get the best deals in the world. Um, and only time will really tell. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's kind of what we're seeing. And and that's mostly in office. Like it's still really healthy in in industrial. I mean, good luck buying a warehouse. It's, it's just everybody's lined up for those. Um, good luck buying multifamily. It's still really strong. Retail kind of goes up and down depending on where it is and and what type of retail you're talking about. But office is a little bit of identity crisis. We're not. We're just not seeing it come back yet. We're not. We're still seeing a lot of. We're from home hybrid model, so um, it's 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 a weird time. I, I just think we're going to need a little bit more time. And, and overall, commercial just moves a little slower, right? Because these deals are longer and leases are longer. And so the response rate and you have a lot of institutional investors and, and they have really long, <laughs> really long deals. So it, 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 it just takes a little bit more time for us to see exactly how it's going to pan out. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, Annie, given, you know, you have such a wide exposure to all these different types of commercial real estate. If you were a rookie investor and you were starting fresh today, which type of commercial real estate would you go after? Would you go after industrial? Would you go after uh, multifamily? Like when I think for myself of like which commercial asset class might have the most upside right now. Like we're looking at hotels and motels because we're already in the Airbnb space. So there's some upside there for us operationally. But I also love the idea of kind of like the the strip mall that has like the dentist and the nail salon and the barbershop, because those are things that you can't do virtually. So to me, it's like you're going to have some upside there. But I'm curious, like, what, what are your thoughts? Like if you had to start today, which way would you go? Well, it depends on your budget, and I would say it depends on your interest. I mean, you're going to have to deal with these tenants, um, and and you want to know their business. So if, you, if you're going to go after warehouses, or if you're going to have something in heavy industry, I would suggest you understand a little bit about the types of businesses that will be your tenants. Do you know about auto body stuff? Do you know about manufacturing? Do you know about storage. If you understand their business, you can work with them a little bit better and and know your market and what makes a qualified tenant. Um, where retail is is quite its own thing too. So it versus office, I mean we have we see a lot of small office owners are are people with an insurance agency or um you know, businesses that have had to rent these types of spaces before themselves and understand what goes into an office or what makes you a good office landlord. So um, if there's something that you already maybe have a little bit of knowledge or interest in to begin with, maybe start there. Industrial is just a higher price point. It's just harder to buy. I mean, even the smallest big warehouse, they're, they're out there, but ultimately um, you're going to need several million to, to get in on a warehouse. They have a lot of maintenance. Um, they're just bigger and it's just a bigger animal versus maybe a small multi-tenant professional office building. That's a little bit small, more bite size for your first time investor, especially if you can occupy one of those and sort of be on site. Um, retail is also tends to be really big because you get these, like you said, strip malls. Um, but you, everybody has that cute little downtown district, right? That has the boutique retail building that you might be able to buy for under a million. And um, it's a little bit risky because you may have like one tenant or two tenants. And so you're really dependent on those businesses, but it starts somewhere. You just got to buy one, you know, and get it going and stabilize it. So if that's like, if you're, if your small town is what you love and you're interested in that and you want to see success in your downtown business district, start looking there and it'll be a really good landlord. That's exactly what happened with me. There was just this beautiful mixed use brick building on this super small t town. And I just loved it so much. And I waited uh, over two years to buy this building because the person wanted 90,000. I ended up getting it for 20,000. But part of my holdup of actually purchasing it was that I didn't know what to put into it. It was such a small town. Like, what would people need in there? Could I fill both units? So what we did was we actually uh, put in a liquor store in there because there wasn't one that was close to that town at all. Um, 
So we opened a business and bought the building. And then we had the two residential units upstairs, which there we had other units in that same town and there was still a, a high demand for units. So that was kind of our safety net of getting into commercial was going with that mixed use where we were so familiar with residential that we knew the residential units could carry the building in case, you know, our liquor store business failed and we couldn't rent the other build or the other side. And we ended up getting a cute little boutique, you know, gift clothing store that went into the other side. And it really does make it nice in that main street. But um, yeah, that was like a big holdup for us too, is to like what could actually even go in there and kind of delay us from actually buying it. But one thing I want to ask is with the the leasing process and finding those tenants, is that something your commercial broker can help you with as far as doing the vetting, writing up the lease? And maybe you could even talk about uh, triple net leases too with commercial tenants. Yeah, great. So absolutely. In my work, I do about 80% leases and 20% sales. So we mostly do leasing, which is so valuable for all of our sales because tenants and leasing are so relevant to the buying and selling of commercial deals. Um, completely relevant. So we can we have an idea of what the market, where the market's at, what rents are at, what people are asking for, what tenant demand is, uh, which all plays into it. So yes, your, your broker will continue to do all of your leasing if you want them to. And it works just like sales is in terms of commissions. Um, generally, a broker will get somewhere between five and 6% of the net value of the lease. So your broker's incentivized to bring in a longer deal, right? If they bring in a five-year term um, with higher rents, then they get a little bit higher commissions, they're working on your behalf. But um, they'll also, so they'll do the marketing, right? Put it out there on all those property exchanges that I was talking about that other brokers see. In our firm, we're um, pretty obsessive about putting stuff on Craigslist and Facebook everywhere we can to to reach tenants even who aren't represented because so many tenants are not represented by brokers. Um, and then bring those tenants in and vet them. Very important. I've had my horror stories <laughs> from the past. <laughs> even this past year, I toured a tenant that turned out to be a second degree murderer and a total con artist who's oh indicted God. in the state of Colorado. And we toured it and it was this deal. It was the deal from heaven. They wanted everything. It was too good to literally be true. So <laughs> you don't want you want your broker out there doing some vetting for you. Um, and then when they can bring a qualified tenant to the table, they can help that with that uh, proposal process of putting together. Here's what we propose for rents, terms, everything. Come to terms with that and then move into the lease phase. Um, and then when renewals come up, your broker can help you renegotiate renewals or maybe put it back out there if that tenant's going to move out and find the next tenant for you. And keep in mind vacancies, um, well, not just vacancies, but the, the time that it takes to find a tenant in a commercial deal is months. I mean, it's not something that happens overnight. The absolute fastest deal, fastest deal I've ever been able to do, lease deal that was like, it was the perfect place. It was the first thing we saw. These tenants moved so fast. They were awesome. They were on it. Everything I told them to do, they did it immediately. And the absolute fastest we could close this was like two and a half months. <laughs> so it just takes time from the time they said, I want this place to when we signed the lease. So it does take time. Sometimes it takes six months. Sometimes, and, and I know landlords get frustrated and they always, after a while, they're like, what are you doing for me? But it's just finding that perfect match, um, depending on the seller and the, the landlord too, not the seller, the landlord, um, and how picky they are, it can take long too. So there's a lot of dynamics. Um, what was the second half of your question? Net leases. So let's talk about leases. In commercial, you're going to see uh, there's a few different types of leases. And it's really important because it plays into later your rent roll and your pro forma and your cap rate and everything that we talked about. But um, landlords tend to favor what are called triple net leases. And what that means is you sort of divide up the rent and you take base rent and base rent is just all the money that goes straight into the landlord's pocket. That is just the pure rent. And that's usually represented in a price per square foot per year. It's so annoyingly confusing, but bear with me. You go, let's say you have a 1,000 square foot space and it's $10 per square foot per year. Well, how do I figure out my monthly rent? You take $10 times 1,000 and that's your annual rent. And you take that annual rent and you divide it by 12. And that's how you find out what you're going to pay monthly. Okay, so that's just rent, what's called base rent. And then there's this other... Um, What's the word? Um, not fixed rent, but... Like variable. Yeah, thank you. Variable rent called the triple net or the OPEX, operating expenses, triple net, nets, whatever you want to call it. And that is the three N's. So it's insurance, taxes, 
maintenance, common area maintenance cam. And so that's like all the stuff that you have to do to maintain hallways and bathrooms and and sidewalks, everything that's shared between the tenants is our common area maintenance. And so we have that, we have insurance and taxes, and these are pass through costs. Landlords do not like to pay those things because that's like on the tenant. They say, oh, that's the tenant. So landlords pass this cost through to the tenant in a price per square foot basis. Usually it's somewhere between four dollars and if you're down on the pearl street mall in boulder it's like 25 dollars. <laughs> really expensive so you have to add that triple net number on top of your base rent so let's say your base rent is ten dollars and your triple net number is five dollars your total rent is fifteen dollars per square foot per year you times that by the number of square your rentable square feet and talk about that and then you divide it by 12 and that is your that's your monthly rent that's everything you owe to your landlord every month and um, landlords like this because taxes and insurance and maintenance are variable costs. They can't predict those. They don't like things that are unpredictable. They want to know what kind of money they're going to get at the end of the month. So um, they, they take all those expenses that they think will add up to X over the year, divide it by 12, and then each tenant pays their pro rata share. So if you occupy 10% of the building, you pay 10% of that. And if you occupy this, you pay whatever. And so at the end of the year, landlords have to do a little bit of accounting and add up all those expenses, all the income they got from the triple net and reconcile that. Was I right? Was I wrong? Was I overestimating? Was I underestimating? And if um, you overestimated, you owe that money back to the tenant. And if you underestimated, the tenant has a bill and pays you. So all of your like variable expenses are covered. And then you have the base rent that you just get every month. So that's why with the NOI, going back to that, um, why we take those variable costs out, because we really just want to know what the rent is that you're getting, like the hard rent. Anyway, so dumb, so confusing, but just know when you, if you're out there looking at what, um, what rents are, there's usually base rent and then there's, and then there's, um, operating expenses. Now you can also run a gross lease and a lot of landlords prefer this just for simplicity's sake, or they've owned the building 1 million years and they don't care anymore. It's all paid off. They just, whatever, they want to be a good landlord. They want to have long-term tenants and they are buddies with the guy that's in there. So, um, you just run gross leases and so you can just do a per month gross and include utilities even. And the, a lot of tenants, of course, love that because it's really predictable what their expenses are every month. Um, you can do a modified gross where it's, you know, all of your all of your rent minus utilities. You have to go pay that separately. Or you could do um, a gross per square foot. There's a lot of different like ways you could skin the cat, but ultimately gross leases are a little bit easier on landlords because they don't have to do all that counting and reconciling at the end of the year and maybe pay an accountant to do something that is really annoying. So, so some people just like how simple it is, but, but generally if you're trying to really build value and build a good income property, that's going to sell for a lot later. You want to run net leases because um, your savvy investors will understand that and it's more predictable for everyone. Thank you, Annie. That was a, a great breakdown on the leases. Um, and I think that's very valuable for us all to hear as to that side, not just the acquisition piece of a property, but when you're actually looking to lease out the property, you do have different options. And as a reminder, all leases are negotiable, whether you're the, the landlord or the tenant. So, um, you know, as long as it's a legal contract, you want to have that. But any other pieces and parts, that's up to you and your tenant to negotiate and can be changed. Uh, Annie, in my notes, I have one thing that I should have asked earlier, but we didn't get to it. And I want to make sure that we ask you this is I want to know about like zoning for commercial property. So if you're looking at a property and it's currently used as, you know, one thing, but how can you get creative with the zoning of properties when looking to purchase to kind of use it to your benefit as the buyer? Super important. Zoning is so important. Well, sometimes it's not important, but it mostly is really important. Um, as an example, today I was showing a property to a tenant and this property is in this area of East Boulder called Flatiron Park and it's sort of this industrial flex area. And a flex property, by the way, is like where maybe you have like a warehouse. It's like a it's like the mullet of commercial <laughs> where it's like party in the front or party in the back and business in front. You have um, like an office, maybe 40 percent or 30 or 20 percent of his office and the rest is warehouse. So um, you might be like e-commerce or who knows what electrician. Um, Flex space and industrial. And this area of Boulder is all IG, which is general industrial. And there's so many offices over here because it's flex space. And in an IG zoning, you can't put like a pure 
professional office. And so you can't put in like an insurance agency that has clients that come and see them because the parking's not set up for that. And there's all these different zoning things, but like an architecture firm, are they professional service? Are they not? It's kind of like this gray area. So when you're buying a commercial property, you got to look at the zoning and figure out how that's going to limit you with what kind of tenants you can put in to your space. Um, so especially if you're looking in like maybe a flex area or industrial, most of the time it's just like commercial. Like it'll just be commercial. And it's like, what is that? You know, I, I don't know. Pretty much anyone can go into commercial or like, but downtown districts a lot of times have, you know, in our downtown, I, I live in Longmont, Colorado. And in our downtown, we don't um, allow pawn shops, but we do have a lot of pawn shops on the, on, on the main drag. And that's because they're grandfathered in. But if that lease were to, if you bought this based on the pro form of this great performance, you know, this awesome rent for a pawn shop, when that lease is up, you're going to have to kick them out because it's grandfathered in. So make sure you know what the different zoning is and what kinds of tenants can go into it. If you're in a more permissive zoning, if you're in a less permissive zoning, and that's something you can call up, call up your municipality and ask them those questions. Usually it's listed in great detail on the website or your broker should know. Super important though. Anna, you've been like a, a wealth of knowledge and I feel like you've given us such a great introduction into the world of commercial real estate investing, but obviously there's so much more. So if folks want to maybe follow up with you after this podcast episode, where can they go to get in touch with you? Great question. Um, you can email me. My email is Annie at marketbolder.com. Uh, our brokerage is Market Real Estate and it's marketbolder.com. So you can find some more information there. Instagram, Annie Larner. Uh, talk about real estate sometimes, but also kids. Fair warning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Love to help anyone. Well, Annie, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciated it. And um, I think this is really the first time we've had a commercial broker on that talked about the commercial real estate. Um, and we've had very few rookies that have come on to talk about it too. So thank you so much for joining us. Still, yeah.